This is the Waterloo battlefield about 200 miles northeast of Paris in what today is Belgium. Here Napoleon suffered his final defeat, but not before thousands of French and Englishmen gave their lives on a steamy summer day in July of 1815. The outcome was certainly in doubt. In fact, had Napoleon attacked a few hours earlier, he would probably have won the battle. But no matter who won or lost, back in London, Nathan Rothschild planned to use the opportunity to try to seize control over the British stock and bond market and possibly even the Bank of England. Rothschild stationed a trusted agent, a man named Rothworth, on the north side of the battlefield, closer to the English Channel. Once the battle had been decided, Rothworth took off for the Channel. He delivered the news to Nathan Rothschild a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier. Rothschild hurried to the stock market and took up his usual position in front of an ancient pillar. All eyes were on him. The Rothschilds had a legendary communications network. If Wellington had been defeated and Napoleon was loose on the continent again, Britain's financial situation would become grave indeed. Rothschild looked saddened. He stood there motionless, eyes downcast. Then suddenly he began selling. Other nervous investors saw that Rothschild was selling. It could only mean one thing. Napoleon must have won, Wellington must have lost. The market plummeted. Soon everyone was selling their consoles, their British government bonds, and prices dropped sharply. But then Rothschild started secretly buying up the consoles through his agents for only a fraction of their worth hours before. Myths, legends, you say? 100 years later, the New York Times ran a story which said that Nathan's grandson had attempted to secure a court order to suppress a book with this stock market story in it. The Rothschild family claimed the story was untrue and libelous, but the court denied the Rothschild's request and ordered the family to pay all court costs. What's even more interesting about this story is that some authors claim that the day after the Battle of Waterloo, in a matter of hours, Nathan Rothschild came to dominate not only the bond market, but the Bank of England as well. Whether or not the Rothschild family seized control of the Bank of England, the first privately owned central bank in a major European nation and the wealthiest, one thing is certain. By the mid-1800s, the Rothschilds were the richest family in the world bar none. They dominated the new government bond markets and branched into other banks and industrial concerns. In fact, the rest of the 19th century was known as the Age of the Rothschilds. Despite this overwhelming wealth, the family has generally cultivated an aura of invisibility. Although the family controls scores of industrial, commercial, mining, and tourist corporations, only a handful bear the Rothschild name. By the end of the 19th century, one expert estimated that the Rothschild family controlled half the wealth of the world. Whatever the extent of their vast wealth, it is reasonable to assume that their percentage of the world's wealth has increased since then. But since the turn of the century, the Rothschilds have cultivated the notion that their power has somehow waned even as their wealth increases. Just one year after Waterloo and Rothschild's alleged takeover of the Bank of England, the American Congress passed a bill permitting yet another privately owned central bank. This bank was called the Second Bank of the United States. Just as before, the primary stockholders remained a secret, but it is known that the largest block of shares, about one-third of the total, were sold to foreigners. As one observer put it, it is certainly no exaggeration to say that the Second Bank of the United States was rooted as deeply in Britain as it was in America. So, by 1816, some authors claim the Rothschilds had taken control over the Bank of England and backed a new, privately owned central bank in America as well. During the early 1900s, men like J.P. Morgan led the charge. One final panic would be necessary to focus the nation's attention on the supposed need for a central bank. 
The rationale was that only a central bank can be prevent bank failures. Morgan was clearly the most powerful banker in America and a suspected agent for the Rothschilds. Morgan had helped finance John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Empire. He had also helped finance the monopolies of Edward Harriman in railroads, of Andrew Carnegie in steel, and of others in numerous industries. But on top of that, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, had been America's financial agent to the British. After his father's death, J.P. Morgan took on a British partner, Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England. By 1907, the year after Teddy Roosevelt's re-election, Morgan decided it was time to try for a central bank again. Using their combined financial muscle, Morgan and his friends were secretly able to crash the stock market. Thousands of small banks were vastly overextended. Some had reserves of less than 1% thanks to the fractional reserve principle. Within days, bank runs were commonplace across the nation. Now Morgan stepped into the public arena and offered to prop up the faltering American economy by supporting failing banks with money he manufactured out of nothing. It was an outrageous proposal, far worse than even fractional reserve banking, but Congress let him do it. His plan worked. Soon, the public regained confidence in money in general and quit hoarding their currency. But as a result, banking power was further consolidated into the hands of a few large banks. By 1908, the panic was over and Morgan was hailed as a hero by the president of Princeton University, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. The money changers had been able to create a series of booms and busts. The purpose was not only to fleece the American public of their property, but to later claim that the banking system was basically so unstable that it had to be consolidated into a central bank once again. After the crash, Teddy Roosevelt, in response to the Panic of 1907, signed into law a bill creating something called the National Monetary Commission. Of course, the commission was packed with Morgan's friends and cronies. The chairman was a man named Senator Nelson Aldrich from Rhode Island. Aldrich represented the Newport, Rhode Island homes of America's richest banking families. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and together they had five sons. John, Nelson, who would become vice president in 1974, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations and former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. As soon as the National Monetary Commission was set up, Senator Aldrich immediately embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, where he consulted at length with the private central bankers in England, France, and Germany. The total cost of his trip alone to the taxpayers was $300,000, an astronomical sum in those days. Shortly after his return, on the evening of November 22, 1910, some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America boarded Senator Aldrich's private rail car and in the strictest secrecy journeyed to this place, Jekyll Island, off the coast of Georgia. With the group came Paul Warburg. Warburg had been given a $500,000 per year salary to lobby for the passage of a privately owned central bank in America by the investment firm Kuhn Loeb and Company. Warburg's partner in this firm was a man named Jacob Schiff, the grandson of the man who shared the Green Shield house with the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Schiff, as we'll find out later, was in the process of spending $20 million to finance the overthrow of the Tsar in Russia. These three European banking families, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the Schiffs, were interconnected by marriage down through the years, just as their American banking counterparts, the Morgans, Rockefellers, and Aldriches were. <laughs> 